Great. So yeah, I'm Peter. Um, it's been a lot of fun being here. I come from an operations research department. And in operations research, the goal is typically to make businesses more efficient. And so it's a very different attitude than you know, being a physicist, where you know, the goal is to understand nature. Um, and I approach science as a process that I want to make more efficient. Um, so I'm going to talk about a collaboration with a group of uh, biochemists, at, mostly at UCSD, uh, some folks now at Northwestern, um, in a paper that was published late last year in Nature Communications about uh, design peptides. So when I talk to experimentalists about the fact that I do machine learning and I'm interested in science, they think that I'm going to do the following thing. So they think that I'm going to ask them for some experimental training data for some you know, biological properties measured in peptides. Then I'm going to train some black box supervised learning model. OK, so here's what they, they think I'm going to do. Collect some data, you know, train a deep net, and then in silico, you know, in my supervised learning model, I'm going to rank you know, peptides by predicted activity according to the supervised learning model, and then I'm going to tell them what the top 10 are, and then they're going to go ahead and they're going to do a wet lab experiment in order to evaluate quality. Um, and then if within those top 10 they find one that they deem to be good, I'll be declared a hero, and if not, I'll be declared to be a villain. Um, and machine learning will be judged to be bad. Um, so the challenge that we all know is that machine learning makes errors. It's, it's not perfect. Here's a, uh, an ROC curve from the classifier that I'll talk about using in this biochemistry application, you know, where I have true positive rate on the y-axis and false positive rate on the x-axis. And if the classifier that I select has a true positive rate of 0.2 and a false positive rate of um, you know, 5%. And if only uh, one in 100,000 peptides are actually bio biologically active for you know, whatever assay I'm looking at, then I'm going to need to test a really large number of peptides that are predicted to be active before I find one that actually works. Okay? So, um, if I walk into a situation like this, use that classifier in the way described on the previous slide, almost surely it's not going to work. So how can we, as machine learning people, do something that's actually useful? useful? So one thing would be always, you know, if you can get more training data, do that. Um, you can try to build prediction methods that perform well uh, with less data and the theme of the workshop is on interpretable, interpretable models, and interpretable models is a, is a good way to do this, you know, including uh, chemical intuition, including, including physical intuition into your model, often improves um, generalization uh, from small amounts of, sm small amounts of training data, um, or, you know, maybe to not use the word generalization, improves predictive accuracy. And also, you know, uh, from an applied point of view, as someone who spends a lot of time working with what I think of as my customers, you know, scientists, um, having interpretable supervised learning models also makes them a lot easier to explain to people that are not experts in machine learning and also makes it a lot easier to understand what it's doing, uh, debug it if it's not doing that, what you think it should be doing, um, and makes it easier to, you know, to customize it uh, uh, to a particular application. So interpretable, interpre interpretable su supervised learning models is a great way to, um, to address uh, some of these challenges. And then the third opportunity, which is the, you know, the core of the technical thing that I work on um, and that I want to, my goal is to, is to sort of articulate the value of doing this to you in this talk, is to make better decisions about which experiments to perform using ideas um, uh, that Andrew talked about yesterday from Bayesian optimization and active learning. And uh, so I'll describe some, uh, one particular method for doing this, and I'll argue that actually this method is, is also interpretable 
um, in, in a sense. Okay, so before I talk about biochemistry, um, I want to explain the core idea, the core value of using Bayesian optimization in a peptide discovery context, um, in the context of something that maybe uh, is more uh, broadly understood, which is uh, recommender systems. So this is my son, Jack, uh, at, a, at a baseball game. Um, and he likes to read. So imagine that I, as a parent, want to facilitate uh, that love of reading and want to make a recommendation to him uh, so that he'll you know, actually spend some time reading instead of just you know, playing Minecraft on his phone. Um, so one thing that I could do is I could get some training data from past books that he decided to read and past books that he chose not to read when I recommended them to him. And I could train a deep neural network and I could make some recommendations. I, I, could, I could make predictions for the probability that he would be willing to read a book uh, if I recommended it to him. Okay, and then I could rank those books by probability he'd be willing to read it. Okay, and then here is perhaps what the supervised learning model um, uh, outputs. So it gives me a bunch of, uh, you know, sort of teenager science fiction uh, sort of novels. Okay, and then here, this is, you know, 40%. That's the, the probability he would read this book if I recommended it to him, 38%, 35, and 30. So then let's say that I use the method of ranking my predictions by, by probability of, of being a hit, probability of being positive, and then recommend the top three. So um, if you want to calculate the probability that he's going to like each one, at least one of these books, one way to do that calculation is first you uh, think about adding this to the set of recommended items, okay? Um, and we're going to calculate as we go the probability that he won't like any of the items in the recommended set. So I'm adding one that has a 60% chance of not being liked, okay? Then the second one that I add, conditioned on him not liking the first book, which says something about, you know, he does, he's not in a mood for science fiction, the probability that he's going to like this book, conditioned on him not liking the first book, is only 10%, okay? So the probability it's not going to work is 90%. So I'm going to have uh, 0.6 times 0.9, okay? That's the probability he won't like any of the first two books. And then the third book, you know, the probability he doesn't like this one, given that he doesn't like either of the first two, because it's also, you know, sort of in the same genre, uh, is 95%. Okay, so I've got 0.6 times 0.9 times 0.95. That's the probability he doesn't like it. Subtract that from one, and I get a number around a half for the probability that this particular set of three items will succeed in my goal as a parent. Okay, so not terrible. Um, but also uh, not great. What's that? It's 50%. It's 50%. It's, it's 50%. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's a different approach. What I can do is the first item that I'll add to my set is the one that uh, is most likely to work. Then I ask my supervised learning method for to rank items according to the probability that he will like them, conditioned on him not liking the first book. Okay? Then what I get is a, a he also likes baseball, given that that photo was at a baseball game, he likes baseball. Um, perhaps what I might get is a set of books that are very different from, you know, this science fiction book, because we already know in this instance he doesn't like this. Okay, so I get a, a ranked list of three baseball books. Um, I add this one to my set, the probability he'll like this book if he doesn't like the first one is one half. Okay, then I repeat that process. I ask my um, supervised learning, um, oh, okay, and then you can, you know, you can calculate uh, 0.6 times 0.5, subtract that from one, and you get 70%. So with a, with a recommendation set of size two, I'm already exceeding the naive recommendation method, what it was able to achieve with a recommendation set of size three. Repeat that process, 
you know, get some sort of like generic school book, which is actually pretty good, um, add that to my set, and uh, achieve a you know, probability of success of, of 76%. So the lesson that I want to draw from this is that by thinking carefully about the goal, the goal is to uh, construct a set of items so that with high probability he'll like at least one. Number one, I did something a little bit non-trivial with my machine learning method. Number two, I was able to achieve a, uh, you know, uh, a measure of success which is much larger than doing the naive thing. Um, uh, and so the, the larger lesson that I want to draw out of this is that kind of in all contexts, including peptide optimization, it's worth not just trying to improve the predictive quality of our supervised learning models, but also thinking carefully about how we use those supervised learning models in order to recommend uh, wet lab experiments. Okay? So these, this, the particular method is not, uh, that I just described, is not a method that I'm aware of that has been uh, previously published, although if you're aware of it, please come tell me. I would love to understand that part of the literature. But these ideas, are very similar to something called Bayesian optimization, which dates back to the 1960s, which ori was originally, it's a, it's a class of machine learning, uh, a class of methods um, designed to optimize time consuming to evaluate functions, originally for designing, uh, you know, sort of PDE based models of engineering systems. And these methods work in, in they have two steps that they use iteratively. First, they build a Bayesian supervised learning model of the thing that they're trying to optimize, and then they suggest experiments to run um, based on something called an acquisition function, which is computed from the predictions and the uncertainty from this supervised learning model. Okay, and these are in a larger class of, of optimal learning methods. So what I want to talk to you about is how we use these ideas to do peptide design, um, and in particular uh, to design Peptide labels. Labels are, um, you know, modifications of peptides that we can use to image them. Uh, for example, using fluorescence. And the kind of peptide labels I'm going to design are going to be what we call orthogonal, uh, which means something different than what you usually think of as uh, being orthogonal uh, if you're an applied mathematician. Um, I'll, I'll describe it in just a moment. Okay. So the goal avoiding jargon, is to find a way to stick things to proteins. Um, amazingly enough, this is something that you can buy. Uh, so it's a pin cushion that if you um, do a lot of sewing, uh, you can use to store your needles. Okay, so you wear it on your wrist and then, you know, uh, you can stick things to it. So I want to do this, my collaborators want to do this, uh, not for people keeping track of their pins and needles, but for uh, proteins, okay? So I want to basically have something that I can attach, you know, the human is a protein, something I can attach to the protein that will enable me uh, with a, an enzyme rather than a pin to stick, you know, sort of arbitrary uh, functional groups to that peptide. So here's how that works. I have a peptide substrate um, illustrated here with a, this is an S if you can't see that in the back, um, with a bunch of X's to the right and to the left. So the X represents one of 20 uh, amino acids that I'm going to substitute in there, okay? And the S is a, is a, is a serine, okay? So this is going to play the role of the pin cushion. And uh, I can embed this peptide into a larger protein who, uh, whose behavior I want to understand in some biological system. Okay? And that's like the person wearing the pincushion. Then I have um, an enzyme which occurs in you know, a large number of organisms. Um, it's actually a class of enzymes uh, called phospho phosphopantothenyl transferases, PPTases. Okay? And what these enzymes do is they catalyze a chemical reaction in which this, which is called phosphopantothene, um, uh, is attached to that serine residue 
so that it you know, sticks off the, you know, the side of the peptide. And what I can do is, let's say that I want to do an experiment where I understand um, after the addition of this enzyme where the proteins in which this peptide is embedded are inside of an organism, uh, I can attach you know, uh, a red dye, something that fluoresces, to the end of this fossil pantothene. Okay? And then I'll basically have a protein that is labeled um, with this red dye. And I could, you know, you don't necessarily have to attach a red dye, you could attach a bead or you could attach, you know, something else to this fossil pantothene that would allow you to manipulate the proteins in which uh, this, this peptide substrate is embedded. Okay? So that's a peptide label, protein label. I actually want to do that for two different enzymes. Okay, so my goal is to, th this, this fo these phospopentothenyl transferases are actually, there's a collection of them. Um, so I have two different ones, one's called SFP and one's called ACPS. And what I want to do is I want to find two different peptide substrates, one of which is labeled by SFP, uh, uh, but is not it is, is inactive with ACPS, okay? And then I want to find a second substrate that has the converse property. So it's active for ACPS and inactive for SFP. And that would let me uh, put two, basically two different pin cushions uh, on this person, on this protein, and I would be able to label it, uh, you know, let's say with red dye um, at this time point uh, at which I uh, wash, you know, the, end, the, the chemical system over with uh, SFP, and then label it with green dye at some later time point uh, at which I would wash it over with ACPS. Um, Google image search is really fun. Uh, this is, you know, just to like close the analogy, this is another kind of pin cushion that uses magnetism. So it's like a different, uh, it's a different, different mechanism than the pin mechanism. Okay. All right. Um, so that's the goal, that's like part of the chemical goal. Another part of the chemical goal is that um, in order to make this uh, labeling, this orthogonal, oh, and the, the property of, of being, um, you know, having the ACPS enzyme not affect the SFP uh, peptide and vice versa, that's called orthogonality. Uh, and um, if a peptide is labeled by SFP but not by ACPS, we call that uh, an SFP-specific um, SFP uh, peptide substrate. Okay, so then um, the second part of the design goal is that these peptides need to be short because I'm going to be inserting them into larger proteins and I don't want them to screw up the function, the biological function of those, uh, of those proteins. Okay, so that's going to mean that um, I mentioned that, that uh, SFP and ACPS come from nature. Um, so it's going to mean, and there are proteins in organisms that are labeled by, by both SFP and ACPS. We're not aware of any uh, proteins in nature that are, uh, that are orthogonal. Um, but if my, you know, just focusing on one part of the goal of finding a peptide that's labeled by SFP, it's going to mean that those proteins are too long to be useful uh, for the design goal. Okay? All right. So the goal is to find two peptides that constitute an orthogonal labeling system um, and that are short. So this, if you've thought at all about uh, uh, peptide optimization, and Andrew talked about this challenge previously, is that, um, you know, there are a lot of peptides. There are 20, uh, you know, we think about 20 naturally occurring amino acids. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you raise 20 to a power like 10, you get a really big number. So the space of peptides is really large. Uh, and also, according to my collaborators, although we, you know, we don't have a good way to confirm this experimentally, um, hits are rare. Um, well, actually, we do have a good way to confirm this experimentally, but we haven't done this. Uh, so hits are rare. They estimate about one in um, 100,000 among, you know, if you just like ran uniformly at random select a short uh, peptide, it's going to be a hit with, you know, probability 1 over 10 to the 5th. Can I ask a dumb thing? Yeah, please. If the position is already decided separately from this, where you're going to put it? Great question. So this um, chemical reaction only occurs at this serine. So uh, 
if we have a peptide that has only one serine in it, then if this reaction is going to work, it's going to have to work at the serine. Um, if there's no serine, then we can discard those peptides. If it has two serines or three serines, then it's actually not uniquely determined. Yeah. Yeah. Include uh, what you would substitute with and where. Yes, that's right. Yeah, because that's going to matter. If I take a peptide sequence and I and I scramble it, then you know very likely that's going to change the chemical activity. Other qu this is like a complicated for me when I was coming up to speed as you know someone who does math to help um, make trucks more efficient. This was really hard for me to understand. Uh, any other clarifying questions about? the design goal? OK, cool. Um, all right, so uh, the, the experimental assay that we have can test about 500 peptides at a time. I'll describe that in a moment. 500 is a lot smaller than 100,000. So that means that if I just search blindly without having some guidance, it's going to take me a long time in order to find an orthogonal hit. Uh, also, each of these experiments takes, you know, at minimum a week, uh, more like a month or even three months, uh, factoring in the fact that the machine might break or, you know, the grad student who's doing the experiments might be busy. Okay, so the way that we test these peptides is we have a membrane, basically a piece of paper, and we have little spots, little circles, and at each of these circles, uh, a machine synthesizes a particular peptide sequence, uh, puts it there, and then we wash over that piece of paper uh, with one of these two enzymes, SFP or ACPS, along with, phos along with phosphopantothene with, uh, uh, fluorophore dye, with a fluorescent dye. And then we take a photo, and the photo might look like this. And uh, spots that are fluorescing red, this is, you know, you can't see that it's red, but spots that are fluorescing, um, those are spots at which the, uh, the chemical reaction that attached the phosphopantothene um, uh, was, was active, okay? So um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a peptide such that when you attach it to the membrane, um, you get a dark dot with one enzyme and you don't get a dot when you wash it over with the other enzyme. So we're gonna divide, we're gonna take a Bayesian optimization approach we're going to divide this problem into two steps. First, I'm going to build a supervised learning model. Um, it's going to be a Bayesian classifier. And it's going to be really simple, almost embarrassingly simple, uh, uh, but also interpretable. And then I'm going to use these predictions in an intelligent way to um, make recommendations about what experiment to run next. The the technical contribution of the work is, is here, really. Um, but I want it, since this is a workshop on interpretability, I want to talk about how this works. Um, because I think there are some things that are useful from this, uh, from an applied perspective. OK, so the classifier that we're going to use is naive base. Very simple. Um, and it's going to be, I'll describe in a moment, a Bayesian version of naive base. So the disadvantage is, is it's not a fancy deep learning model. Um, and perhaps because of that, the predictive accuracy that we're getting from it could be improved by doing something more sophisticated. Advantages are that uh, it's easy to explain to my collaborators that don't have a background in machine learning. It's easy to understand what it's doing and fix it if the thing it's doing isn't what you want. It's easy to customize to our application to add a prior I'll talk about that in a moment. The fact that we have a strong Bayesian prior makes it robust to extremely small amounts of data that we deal with. When we did our first recommendation of experiments to run, we had on the order of 20 measurements. We get, because it's a Bayesian method, we get good quantification of uncertainty. That's going to be really important for making recommendations about what experiments to perform. And also, the structure of the naive Bayes model turns out to give us really good computational scalability. Uh, which I'll describe. So here's how it works. Um, I have a matrix 
So there's a, there are two, naive Bayes assumes that there are two latent matrices. One that, uh, chorus, that describes the distribution over amino acid sequences among those peptides that are active. Uh, there are two enzymes involved here. Uh, for the sake of keeping things simple, just think about one of those enzymes. Uh, so I just have like, it's just a binary classifier. So active means the response is a one. So one of these, pick this column. Okay, so there's some numbers here. Turns out these numbers sum to one. Uh, this is in the column number one relative to the serine. So that's the first, I mean, that's the position to the right of the serine. So if nature is described by uh, this particular matrix, what that's saying is that among all peptide sequences, the frequency with which uh, amino acids that are, you know, A, I, L, M, or V occurs is 61%, okay? And then uh, this matrix corresponds to the amino acid frequencies among uh, peptides that are misses. You'll note that we are co uh, collapsing together a bunch of different amino acids based on uh, physical properties, again, in order to be able to sort of regularize with very small amounts of data, okay? And then if you were to know these matrices, you can calculate using Bayes' rule the uh, probability that a particular peptide X is a hit, um, and this is Bayes' rule, okay? So that's kind of vanilla naive Bayes. We want to deal with small amounts of data, and we need a quantification of uncertainty, so we put this in a naive Bayes, even though Bayes is in the title, isn't is often not a, a Bayesian method. Um, in order to make it a Bayesian method, you need to put a prior distribution on the uh, model parameters. Uh, what we do is we put independent Dirichlet priors on each, if you're a Bayesian, you know that Dirichlet plays nice, is a conjugate prior for uh, multinomial distributions and so things play nicely. If you're not a Bayesian, don't worry about it. Um, so we put a prior on each of these columns and the prior mean is proportional to the number of amino acids in that class. Um, that basically corresponds to sort of a, a non-informative prior in some sense. Um, not really non-informative, but it, 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 uh, if the frequencies were proportional to the number of amino acids in that class, it would say that that position has no effect on determining whether something is a, is a hit or not. And then um, we believe that the amino acids that are close to the serine, which is where the chemical reaction actually occurs, are more important in determining uh, uh, biological activity. And so the prior on columns that are further away from the serine, which we think are less important, uh, we make that prior more concentrated on the mean. Okay? So this method is okay. It gives you some signal. Here's a rock curve showing true positive rate versus false positive rate after um, doing leave one out on 300 peptides. So you see that you know random guessing would correspond to a straight line. A perfect model would correspond to you know something that went up and over like this. Um, so it's neither perfect nor terrible. Uh, you know there's some signal, but it also has a lot of noise. So the question is, if you have a model like this. And I think no matter what, no matter how hard you work with the kinds of training data that we have, uh, in any application, you're always going to have, you know, reasonably large amounts of, of error. How do you decide what experiments to recommend to your collaborators to run next? Okay, so this is going to be um, sort of the, the core math. I ragged before on ranking by probability of a hit. Let me continue to articulate that this is bad. Um, so what is ranking by probability of a hit? So you first, um, in silico, select those peptides that have a length less than some target. Let's say that you have, uh, th and actually through phage display, which is another experimental technique, there was an 11-mer discovered that was not uh, orthogonal, but that was a substrate for um, SFP and ACPS. So maybe your goal is to find those peptides, find, is to find a peptide shorter than 11 amino acids that uh, is active. So you'd select those peptides that are, have a length shorter than 11, okay, then rank them by predicted probability of a hit according to this 
naive Bayes model, or if you want to plug in something more sophisticated, go ahead and do that. And then, you know, test the, say, top 500, top 300 in a, in a run of your assay. So the problem is, um, very likely, the peptides that all rank in the top are going to all be pretty similar to each other. Just like when I did that for my son Jack, recommending books, all of the top scoring books were science fiction novels geared towards teens. So if the first one doesn't work, then that, suggests, that makes it less likely that the other ones are going to work. Okay? So even though you're testing 500 or 300, effectively you're only testing like 10 or 15 different peptides. So this is very inefficient. In simulation, um, so what we did was we, uh, I trained, or my grad student, Zhao Lei, trained a, uh, the statistical model, okay? Uh, then simulated the, these theta hit, theta miss matrices from the posterior distribution, held that out, uh, and then simulated what performance of different methods would be um, if nature were actually described by that theta hit and theta miss matrix. So if you rank peptides by probability of a hit and find, uh, calculate the probability of finding a short hit in the recommended uh, set as a function of the size of the set, you see that it, it's not zero, but it's pretty small, okay? And it doesn't really grow as the number of peptides tested increases. It would be out, it's outperformed by the commonly used approach among, you know, if you go and you talk to uh, my collaborators, or you know, people with a similar background, they say, well, we're just gonna, we're gonna mimic nature and we're gonna mutate known hits. And that's actually not a bad strategy. Um, it achieves a probability of a short hit, you know, kind of like um, 30, 40% if you uh, test uh, 100 peptides, okay? This doesn't use machine learning. So if you went and actually did this and you did a head-to-head -head comparison between this machine learning-based method super fancy, super modern, versus this method from you know, 1870, uh, this method's gonna outperform and machine learning's gonna look really bad, okay? So that is really protein evolution. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, nature's not dumb. Um, you know, mu mutate. Directed, directed evolution, sorry. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, but it's not so much that the, su it's the, the case that I want to make is that it's not, the supervised learning model actually provides a lot of value. You just need to use it in the right way. So if you adopt the approach that I, that I described for recommending books to, to the setting with uh, peptide optimization, use that same supervised learning model, calculate the probability of finding a short hit versus the number of peptides tested, it grows much faster and you can uh, get a reasonably large you know, chance of success uh, with a s relatively small number of experiments. Yeah. So, I mean, the other common method that people use that doesn't involve retraining is just to pick something and then exclude nearby things. Yeah, that's but, true. And, you know, you keep, keep doing that and you kind of cover the Totally. Like. Yeah, that's, gonna, that's a good point. We didn't do that comparison. Um, yeah, I guess the way... Um, yeah, effectively what we're doing is doing that. Uh, the, and it's, the, what we're doing is kind of, you'll see that it's derived, it has some theoretical properties that are nice and is sort of first principles in a particular way. From a practical point of view, it would get, our, our method is parameter free, whereas if you excluded um, nearby peptides, you would need to choose a, you choose a metric over peptides and then you would need to choose like, how much do you exclude? And you, you know, um, but yeah, still, that's a good point. I would, I would bet it's going to be like, you know, like here. It's going to be pretty competitive. They, they, they are close, not in the intrinsic metric, but in the output metric. They are close in, close in how they perform. That's right. That's right. Yeah? So I see that if you work with experimentalists, a lot of times they'll put together these motif finding models. Mm. And then they by hand put hits into different motifs. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we also haven't done that comparison. Um, we wanted, yeah, we, we, we haven't done that comparison. Um, a thing that we want to do is do like a head-to-head -head, uh, thing where we have, you know, hu we, have a, we pick a human um, and we do, you know, 
ML plus Bayesian optimization versus the human. Uh, the qualitatively, the hits that you get from this are are more diverse and they look kind of like more random than the kinds of things that you would get from a, from from like a human thinking about motifs. Um, so that's interesting because your method doesn't have motifs. Right, it doesn't. But this kind of induces motifs, right? It induces a belief over uh, the value of having an amino acid at a particular position. And then it constructs peptides that, um, you know, like, many of which have those kind of good amino acids at those positions, uh, but, but they aren't motifs because the naive Bayes model is kind of independent across position. You could, a thing that we thought about doing, uh, but decided not to because of the small amount of data, is you can generalize this naive Bayes, instead of using, um, like you could take pairs of amino acids and have those be your features um, and do like basically the same thing and then you would be learning motifs. Uh, then it might be more similar to what a human would do. Is there a chance that if you looked at what was selected along pool and then data analyze those, then maybe motifs would jump up? Um, yeah, I think that's true. To, to the extent that, uh, you know, in nature, motifs are important for, if you know. If motifs are important, they will come. If they're, yeah, so like if we're, we're trying to learn nature, if we have enough data, we'll like learn nature. Um, and then, yeah, then you'll see these motifs. Uh, I had a question. And, yeah. Uh, I told you that I used the wrong analogy. So very often, optimal properties hit on the top of fairly narrow wells. Yeah. So as far as I understand, when you use your approach, you kind of accelerate your pathway down the bottom of one specific well. Mm. Does it mean that you sacrifice the discovery of other wells in this kind of optimal surface? Um. I would say that we, we to kind of like continue the analogy, I would say that that's what this approach is doing. It's falling down one of the wells. Um, it's, what it's doing is it's optimizing an objective function that it is pretty sure is the right objective function that represents nature, but nature might not be represented by that. So yeah, it goes, it goes super deep down this one well, whereas what this is doing is it's it's, you know, it finds a it finds a well, and then it, you know, chooses to synthesize a peptide that is good if that's the objective function. And then it says, oh well, what if that's not the objective function, and the one that I thought was going to be good is actually really bad? Um, how does that change my objective function? Now let me re-optimize. Yeah. Cool. All right. So let me show you a little math uh, about how this method is is derived, um, which maybe is already clear from the example, uh, and then I'll just show you a little bit of theory. So yeah, goal is to find short hits. More specifically, um, the goal that we use in designing the method, which may or may not be our real goal, Andrew and I had a nice conversation yesterday about like, what is your goal in peptide design? Um, but the goal is to find at least one hit of length B or shorter. For us, B was 11. Okay, so then let's design a, an experiment that tests a batch of peptides that maximizes the probability of reaching this goal. As an operations research problem person, I like optimization problems. Here's the optimization problem that this goal translates to. So my objective function is, is uh, the probability of there being at least one short hit in the set of peptides that I choose to test, S. S is a subset of the space of all peptides, and the number of elements in S has to be less than or equal to the maximum number of peptides I can attest in an experiment, which is typically um, you know, somewhere between 200 and 500, depending on how many spots my collaborators want to give me on the membrane. OK. Ugh. So this is a hard uh, optimization problem because the space of uh, size k sets of length b peptides is really big. Um, so the number of peptides of length b is 20 to the b, which already is like, you know, getting kind of a little bit big. 
And then uh, the number of size k sets is 20 to the b choose k. So for example, if b were 14 and k were 500, this would be 10 to the 19th choose 500, which is like an enormous number. So there's no way I can enumerate. Uh, um, what I need to do is to use problem structure in order to either optimize this or come up with a good approximate solution. So what we're gonna do is adopt an idea which is common in combinatorial optimization where we're gonna build up the set of peptides to test in stages using a greedy approach. So in one step of that approach, we're gonna maximize over all peptides um, that are not that have not already been added to my set of peptides to test, and um, the objective function is going to be the same as the objective function in my original problem, the probability that there's at least one short hit in, um, in, this, uh, in the set of peptides I would test if I would add E to it. So I do this starting with S is equal to the empty set, and I iterate until S has 500 peptides in it. So it turns out that you can, so a thing that people worry about uh, in combinatorial optimization is the quality of the, of the solution from an approximate algorithm as compared with, um, as compared with uh, the optimal. Uh, and you might worry that it would be, you know, uh, very, 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 very bad. So you can prove um, that this algorithm is what we call a constant factor approximation. Uh, where if I look at the performance gap in terms of probability of finding a good peptide between actually solving that combinatorial optimization problem and this greedy approach, and I normalize by the performance of, of solving it optimally, that's bounded above by uh, 1 minus 1 over E, which is about 63%. And the proof of this is uh, to show that the objective function is, is, is monotone. That's sort of easy to see that it's, it's non-decreasing. So as I add elements to my set to test, the probability of finding at least one short hit in that set is gonna, is gonna grow. And then it's also what we call submodular, which is a, general, which is a, a version of concavity uh, for uh, functions over sets. Um, and then it turns out that if you have a monotone submodular function and you uh, do optimization subject to a cardinality constraint, you get this kind of uh, constant factor guarantee. Moreover, you can implement this greedy algorithm efficiently. Um, so the greedy step, finding the peptide to add such that S union E has the largest probability of uh, uh, containing a short hit, it turns out that that problem is equivalent to the following. You look over all peptides that you haven't yet added and find the one for which the, prob the conditional probability of it being a hit uh, m conditioned on the previous ones in the set. Um, uh, uh, so, so, so this is basically the same thing as what I described in the book example with Jack. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there's sort of a simple uh, transformation involving basic probability that shows that um, doing this in a greedy algorithm is equivalent to what I described previously. No, it's very general. It's just, uh, um, it's like, you know, I want to solve max over E of the probability like so this thing you can write as Um, times so that's just like basic that's always true um, this number doesn't depend on E and this number is uh, okay I need the property that this is strictly positive um, so yeah that's why so yeah 
you know, I've explained this method in the context of naive Bayes, but the, the results for this greedy algorithm generalize to other supervised learning models. Moreover, a way that you can calculate this thing uh, is to retrain your model treating all peptides in S as misses, okay? And then you, then you just uh, you know, re-rank by that new trained supervised learning model, which is the same thing as what I was doing um, in the example with, with Jack. The, the place where naive Bayes is special is that when I do that, the resulting optimization problem that I need to solve over peptides of a particular length is a separable optimization problem, which allows me to solve it by considering each position separately. Whereas uh, if I had a model for which that wasn't true, <coughs> I would need to do, solve an optimization problem over the space of all peptides, which, you know, like 20 to the B might be outside, might be hard to, to do through complete enumeration. Yeah, so this is like bad. We just randomize, so I select a class, and then I just, uh, um, then I select an amino acid from that group to actually synthesize, yeah. Yeah, and I think there are a lot, that's, a, that's an opportunity I think that we're, we can improve what we're doing here. Um, we, you know, we started, we started going with this project and we had a supervised learning model, and then we started doing experiments and I didn't want to change we had all these ideas about how we would improve the, the ML model, but we didn't want to change it because, you know, you don't want to like do that mid-flight. So, um, I've talked about this before, but you know, here's the intuition for why this works. Um, right, so what I just argued is that doing the greedy step where I find the peptide to add uh, that maximizes this is equivalent to finding the peptide to add that maximize the probability of being a hit given that there are no short hits in S. You can compare this to the rank, the classical kind of naive rank by probability of a hit approach, which doesn't do this conditioning. So what this conditioning does is it forces you, you know, as you were saying, it forces you away from the previously recommended peptides um, and, and creates a more diverse, uh, diverse set. To illustrate that, here is a, just a two-dimensional embedding. What, what we did is we just took a, a distance measure over peptides, um, I think the Hamming distance or something similar, and then just did a two-dimensional embedding showing the recommendations from pool, which are in red, uh, the training data, these gray squares, there are lines going from the pool recommended peptides to the closest uh, training data. Um, the same thing for mutation, these blue triangles, and then predict and optimize. <coughs> the, the rank by probability of a hit approach. What you see is that the rank by probability of a hit approach is like not diverse at all. It's very clustered in this part of peptide space. Um, mutation is very, you know, is very diverse. Uh, it's exploring much broader and that's why it works better than rank by probability of a hit. Um, what Pool is doing is sort of somewhere in between where it has clusters of points in parts of the space that seem to be good, but um, instead of just having one cluster, it has you know, many clusters here, here, kind of up here, over here. And you only, you know, you get one peptide, which is basically the top scoring peptide, which is uh, common across um, this approach and, and, and Pool. <coughs> So uh, it works on the membrane, I'll show you in a moment. Uh, my collaborators also did experiments where they took the peptides that were discovered using this approach and they wanted to understand, you know, a lot of time surface chemistry is different than chemistry in solution, so they wanted to understand whether um, these peptides would be active uh, when put inside of a, a protein. So they, they uh, in E. coli, uh, synthesized green fluorescent protein um, uh, conjugated with these lead SFP selective hits. And so what you see is uh, um, pictures of a gel, so these are the controls, pictures of a gel where you see activity for um, when treated with SFP and not ACPS, 
you see, ac you see don't see activity when treated with ACPS, and then this is just another control where, where nothing was treated. Um, the ACPS type uh, specific peptides actually don't work, uh, and apparently we realized after the fact that's because there's endogenous uh, ACPS inside of E. coli that's part of their, just uh, how they work um, as organisms um, that, uh, that, that labeled um, without the fluorescent dye the ACPS type peptides. So those work on the membrane but not uh, on GFP. And then here's another kind of uh, validation where we took two membranes um, and synthesized them identically so that you have ACPS type hits over here uh, in a circle with a letter A and then SFP selective peptides over here in a circle with an S. We took this membrane, washed it over with ACPS. You see uh, ACPS labeling, um, a little bit of SFP labeling, but not too much. Uh, and then when you wash that membrane over with SFP, you see SFP labeling, maybe a little bit of um, ACPS labeling, but not too much. And then these are peptides that are not active for, uh, for either enzyme. OK, so just in summary, uh, peptide optimization with optimal learning, or pool, uses a Bayesian optimization style approach to find short uh, orthogonal peptide substrates. The way that it works is it iteratively constructs batches of peptides to add, each time retraining the supervised learning model, uh, saying that peptides that had been added previously are not active. Um, the method has found uh, hits that have been experimentally validated that are shorter than um, the shortest previously known, and if you're interested in reading more, you can check out this paper, and almost all the math is in the supplement, uh, so you should read the supplement. Cool, so thanks.